Hello and welcome to another episode of Breaking Mayberry, the economical podcast that delivers the most entertainment per minute of value on your Spotify list. I'm one of your hosts, I'm Marty Schneider. I'm the other host, Dan Ludwig. We cannot hold up to that promise, but like... No. <laughs> well, let's say per second, like like pound for pound, like the ratio is good for us. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're definitely, you're coming out on we're, top when you we're invest We're lean. We, we don't got a lot of fat here. There's not, there's not. We, we trim up a lot of it, except for this bit right here that's clearly not working, but we're still doing it. No, so, yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> This is, it can't all be winning seconds. All right, now I feel pressured to just move right on into content. Hey, Marty, do you want intro? <laughs> yes, this is where intro goes. Okay, so my lovely girlfriend got me a wonderful Christmas present of an electric uh, scooter. Like an, an electric razor scooter. Literally a razor scooter? Yeah, yeah, it's like an electric, and she didn't get me a Vespa. Like, it's... It's like one of the ones you you might be familiar with them if you live in like L.A. or Nashville. Drunk people usually ride them around and leave them on the sidewalk. Oh, uh, this is like one of the like like the bird scooters. It's like, like a bird scooter. Okay. Except I own it. I, you, own I, it. You, you, don't, I don't, you don't rent it constantly. Okay. I'm not leaving it as litter around the city, and I'm not an entire bachelorette party in Nashville. I once visited San Diego, and I was walking along the beach, and I just. Like came across like a cave or something, like I, basically like like a a rock wall that was just littered with those things. I counted at least twelve and three shopping carts. People in L.A. would just smash them. Like you would just like walk like drive somewhere and you would just see a guy stomping <laughs> on one on the side. I do. I do. I gotta say, I do like the idea of a mode of transportation <laughs> that when I'm done with it, I can just go yeet. And just hook yeah. it off a cliff. <laughs> and it, it must be extremely satisfying. And it, to just it, it's be like, not my and I'm done with this and just walk away <laughs> from like a three hundred dollar piece of machinery. And it, it it you know, it might cost me money, they'll cancel my account or whatever, but it's gonna cost the Silicon Valley Tech Pro investor that put money into way more, way more than I did. Like Movie Pass, which is somehow coming back, I've heard. Anyway, you've oh, got yeah, a, it is. You've got a scooter. But Go on. I, I was in Nashville, and so they were going to do bird scooters in Philadelphia, and the Philadelphia like transit authority were like, no fucking way in hell. We'll destroy People, them. We can- yeah, one, we would destroy them, and two, we would also drive them wasted. Just absolutely hammered. We're savages. Like, you can't <laughs> trust us with those. I mean, I went to I went to Nashville, and Nashville is like mostly bachelorette party, and I just saw like... Uh, a group of drunk 20-somethings just ride a fleet of them into traffic. Just, like, almost cause a pileup. <laughs> but, yeah, so I have one of those now. It's awesome, really helpful, helps me get around, like, the city really fast. I bet you look I, like an idiot. Oh, I look like an absolute fucking tool on it. <laughs> I mean, I am, like, I I am in my third, I am in a long-term monogamous relationship I have nothing to prove to anybody. I'm going to ride around on a fucking Razor scooter and look like a D-bag. I, mean, yeah, I don't no, give a shit. There's a certain point where like, you, you have a steady paycheck and you don't give a shit. If I was trying to look cool just like going down the street, that would mean I'm up to something. For sure. I, I mean, yeah. honestly, again, the, the the two guys on the Andy Griffith Show podcast are not going to be fooling anybody. <laughs> I if... don't have it. Yeah. <laughs> this podcast is proof that I don't have anything to prove to anybody. <laughs> we should really get you a Breaking Mayberry sticker to put on it. And I, I've taken it on one test drive in the city of Philadelphia, which was pretty fun, went pretty well. One interesting thing about it is that it makes the senior citizens of Philadelphia want to talk to me desperately. Like I was out with it for maybe an hour (laughs) and six old people, six, not necessarily old people, six people over the age of 50 just came up and were like, Hey man, what's going on? What you got there? That's really cool. I love that. Well, tell me everything about you. I want to know so much about who you are and what your deal is. I was like on my way back and I stopped at an intersection. 
suddenly a, a man's head just over my shoulder and he was just going, Hey, we match. And it was like, Oh Jesus. And like, like jumped away from him and saw that he had an identical <laughs> scooter <laughs> and was just like, what are you riding yours on? You on sport or are you on cruiser? And I was like, I, I don't, I don't know. And he was like, Oh, you're doing sport. That's a good move. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Should have gotten his card. You guys and, could form a club together, be in a gang. And, and before a you scooter ask, gang. yes, he did look like an NFT guy. Of course and, he did. Yeah, yeah. He he looked like he was going to like he professionally consulted people about cryptocurrency. This this seems like a, a natural advancement in the life of Dan, right? It, yes. It, it feels like you know Dan joining a scooter gang and becoming. Best friends forever with a regional sales manager named Ernie. Yeah. Uh, you know, I feel Honestly, like- <laughs> that sounds great if I just formed, if I just went to the bingo hall and formed the Wildcats. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the movie Wild Hogs. <laughs> but on ra- yeah. electric razor scooters throughout South Philadelphia, it's you and three mummers. Wild Hogs too. slop it up. <laughs> Yeah, just tearing us around, harassing people. Just me and Muriel and Irving, just just tearing ass around South Philadelphia. <laughs> yeah, this is this is my fucking life now. It's awesome. It's extremely fun, and I've just abandoned all pretense of being cool because it fucking rules. But I, I do gotta ask, right? Like driving that thing kicks ass, doesn't it? Oh, it's the it's the best. <laughs> All right, like, I, I can't I can't make fun of you. Like it's the it's the shit. <laughs> it sounds like, like it kicks ass. <laughs> yeah, no, like just tearing ass around town. I'm not on a bicycle anymore, so no one's trying to fucking murder me. Like you're like you're you're not at Segway level, right? Like you're, of mockability. If you were like the guy who no. tears around on a Segway, we could might make fun of you, but like. A scooter's a scooter, whatever. Like I once the summer comes and I can like wear sunglasses and be a little day drunk, I'm gonna look cool as shit on this thing. <laughs> Alright. I'm gonna I'm gonna figure out how to accessorize this scooter. Maybe with a Hawaiian shirt. Maybe I'll lean into like a real Jimmy Buffett vibe. So speaking of poor investments, today's episode. <laughs> Today's episode is Season 4, Episode 24, Bargain Day. Originally airs March 23rd, 1964. Directed by Jeffrey Hayden and written by that son of a bitch, John Whedon. John Whedon, who clearly just did the thing from The Usual Suspects, where he just like looked around a room and Kaiser <laughs> Soze together a script. <laughs> like He was just like, like, oh shit, I have to write a script. Mad about money and the purchase of a freezer. Okay, <laughs> bing, bang, boom. Like, turn it in. Give me the 1960s equivalent of $50,000, please. Thank you. If you've never heard us talk about John Whedon before, uh, yes, he is, in fact, the grandfather of Joss Whedon. He's also the oldest member that we can tell of the Andy Griffith Show writing room. So he's already the old man in the room of the old man TV show of Andy Griffith. He's like 65, which... The, the Andy Griffith Show is meant to feel like it's in the 1930s, and he's old for that. Yeah. Like, he dates that show. I believe he was born in, like, 1892. <laughs> he wrote an episode about how you shouldn't trust trust traveling snake oil salesmen. A thing that definitely had not been a problem for a while. Probably since the old goddamn West. Okay, no, he, he was born in 1905, and he died in my hometown of Medford, Oregon. Hey, good job! <laughs> we killed him! Crushing it, yeah! <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's something you should put on your city hall plaque. <laughs> We, like, oh yeah, we were founded this year, and we took out John we, Whedon. Oh man, you're goddamn welcome. If if we we're coming for the rest of you, we're coming for the other Whedon. <laughs> you know to stay out, Whedon clan. You know what you did. And here is your one sentence summary from Wikipedia. It's two cent summary this time. Aunt B buys a 150 pound side of beef at a discount market, but the Taylor's old freezer, also a bargain, doesn't work. However, she refuses to call the handyman because he is too expensive. So, were you unsettled by how 
how relatable this episode was. For sure, for sure. Yeah, like, it hit unpleasantly close to home in terms of things I have thought about and felt. I mean, I was actually jealous of the freezer as soon as it was mentioned. Like, yeah, as, as soon as Aunt B mentioned that they had an old freezer out on the porch, I was like, fuck yeah! In my new apartment, where, where I live now, I was very excited because when we moved in, because we've got a fridge that has water in the door. I push the nice. push the button and the water comes out of the door. Oh. I got water in the fridge door money, baby. That oh, is that is that is, a, a, that is a life achievement unlocked. And you know what the next the next step for me as like a an adult and a homeowner is outside fridge. Yeah. Outdoor fridge. Having having a fridge that's just for 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 drinks, drinks and beer goes in the outside fridge. Everyone knows this. Every person who grew up in, with a porch like knew someone who had the outdoor fridge. And oh. and if you are in a if if you're in a rural area and you're like real rural wealthy, like you have the chest freezer. Like Yeah. The chest freezer. So this this episode That that's the fridge that exclusively has good shit in yes. it. Where if like if you're ten and you're walking to the fridge that's either on the porch or in the garage, you're like, I'm about to get myself a diet slice and a push pop. Oh, that's where yeah. the Capri Suns go, baby. Oh, hell yeah, I'm about to live life. Uh so there's a thing of popsicles in there that my aunt forgot about two years ago, and they're going in this guy. <laughs> So this episode, like, the the moral of this episode is supposed to be, like, sometimes a bargain isn't really a bargain, right? Sometimes sometimes you try to save, like, a little bit of money and it just weighs, winds up being way too much. Uh, That's the moral they're going for. What it really comes across is uh, saving money is stupid and so is this dumb old lady. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm going to be honest with you. At one point, I was sitting on my couch going, like, Yep, you know, you get what you pay for. Oh, God, how old am I? No, I need to get, I need, I need to find mushrooms and do them. Oh, God, I'm so old. When did this happen? So this opens up with the, the Taylor family at breakfast. And they're sitting there basically just chatting about how it's going to be real warm. Yeah, they, they're talking about it being hot. They, and then they get into various schemes i guess you could call them schemes that ampy had to save money it, it starts with basically opie just asks for some sugar with his breakfast Aunt B goes to the to the closet and pulls out a big ass 10 pound bag of sugar and tries to pour it directly into the sugar thing and it winds up spilling all over it takes her way too long to notice <laughs> and andy goes well, why why do you have that giant bag? She's like, well, it's more economical to buy in bulk. And he goes, yeah, but you wind up spilling half of it. And I'm sitting there going, only if you don't have object permanence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> buy a fucking cup. Like, put, <laughs> put something in the sugar to make it more manageable in, in transfer. Or just put the bowl, put the sugar dish inside of the sugar it's bag. It's the easiest what? problem to solve. It's like infomercial difficult. To, uh, difficult to solve. It's nothing. It's like, has this ever happened to you? Spills a bunch of sugar all over the thing. There must be a better way. And so that 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 gets into my my key issue with this uh, episode, which is that in order for any of it to work, Aunt B has to be a fucking moron. The Aunt B is. This is another episode with no Barney in it. And guess who has to wear the special crown of dipshit for it? That's right, it's Aunt B. And it sucks because we haven't had an Aunt B episode in months. Like, she's been notably absent from this show. And so she finally gets an episode dedicated to her, and it's about her being a fucking idiot. She is deeply and profoundly frustrating in this because her behavior makes no goddamn sense, but in a way that is relatably frustrating right she has no problem solving ability whatsoever and i think a big part of what this comes down to is ampy in this episode is super easily conned she's very easily tricked out of money through perceived savings which okay that that does fall in line with ampy's characterization thus far like that that is true ampy does fall for things a lot but do you remember like at the beginning of this show where Aunt B was like almost a foil for Andy. Yeah. And like, sometimes they would get into arguments and Aunt B would be like, you got Aunt B, bitch. And like, yeah. do you remember when that happened? 
and and like you were allowed to show Andy having any competition whatsoever. Like- Andy was Bugs Bunny, and Ampy was the gremlin that's sometimes over his shoulder fucking his shit up. One of the things that frustrates me about the show is that, like, in order for Andy to be daddy, you have to dial up the stupid on everybody else so that he can solve yeah. the problems. What other what other schemes do they so mention? So the, the big one is that she bought Opie some new shoes. Yeah. And the shoes are very squeaky and also very big on him. And she's... Like, well, he'll grow into them. And he's like, well, he'll wear them out before he grows into them. I don't even have an opinion it doesn't really make on sense. that argument. I've, yeah, it doesn't really make any sense, right? Like, he's not going to wear the shoes until he grows into them. So, I could you know, probably figure out who I think is an idiot in this uh, argument. I don't care enough to do yeah. that. I'm not going to get into relative shoe integrity over this fucking episode. And, th- and, then, and then Andy makes fun of Aunt B because she bought a freezer. That's out on the porch. She bought a freezer at auction that's never held anything. And here's the thing. I'm sitting there going, that's a that's a reasonable purchase to make. Yeah. Like, Aunt B says, okay, well, it was at an auction, and it seemed like it was really good, and it was there. And he says they've never used it. And I'm screaming, why? Why have Use you used it then? Why have you never used it? And not only have they never used it, we found out we find out later she's never plugged the thing in. Yeah. Like, it's never been touched. And okay, th- th- and, and he's like he he says it as if it's a fault of the freezer. He's like that shitty freezer that we've literally never used. And I just want to be like, well, then use it. You have agency here. You can buy a hunk of meat and put it in the goddamn freezer and plug it in. I'm just saying you're not a child. I'm just saying that seems like a very logical thing for a family of three. Let's say four or five because they're always feeding everybody else, right? Like it's it, that's not an unusual thing to purchase, and this show and Andy treat it like you fucking idiot. Again, again, this this show like really comes down on the idea of saving money. And, and here's here's what I want to th- think about is like we all know somebody who does this. Maybe you are someone who does this. We're all guilty of this, right? Buying a thing just because it's on sale, it's a bargain. You know, yeah. Some people do it pathologically. Aunt B probably would be like this kind of like pathological bargain hunter because she lived through the Great Depression. If this sh- this episode is so anti buying things in bulk to save money, if you brought John Whedon to a BJ's, it would turn into an active shooter situation. <laughs> and and that's what it really comes down to. It's like this is first off, this is a women be shopping episode in yes. disguise. Like, it, it's just a disguise, but it's also just like, ha ha, these penny pinchers, they are so silly. <laughs> in, <laughs> Why do you not just spend more money on the things you have? In my day, Ha-ha. we spent more money or we starve. Aunt B goes out to go to the grocery store. She goes to the grocer and she meets that bitch Clara. Every time Clara shows up, it means trouble in this show. It, she is a bad uh, omen. She is like a fucking raven, man. I don't know why. Clara is, is a sign of bad times on the horizon. I don't know why Aunt, Aunt, Aunt B talks to her, but they run into each other at the store. Like the Well, she's Aunt B's uh, nemesis. Her frenemy. She's like her, her frenemy. Yeah. yeah, you gotta have a good, especially back then, you needed a good nemesis. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And, like... They're just settling up their bill and blah, blah, blah. And then the the guy who runs the grocery store, he goes to answer the phone. And then Clara is like, hey, have you heard about the new butcher shop across town? Diamond Joe's? The sketchiest name for a butcher shop ever. You should check out the prices. And they like sneak out so that the grocer can't hear them. And they're talking outside. uh, And they're like. This roast is like 10 cents a pound, and also, it's like the good old days. You know how stores used to be with sawdust on the floor, and Diamond (laughs) Joe wears a straw hat? And I don't know if this is like a real age thing or so, but I sat there going, what are you talking about? (laughs) Yeah! If I walked into a butcher shop, okay, I I guess I have seen butcher shops with sawdust on the floor, because, like, they're slippery, and you need to, like, have traction. Side no, but it's not a selling point. It's not You're a not selling like, point. Oh right. hell yeah, sawdust. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. No, I'm not excited. I, I mean, I guess I'm happy that my butcher isn't gonna fall down. 
But, that was a thing that they got super mad about during the Industrial Revolution. That was what they wrote the jungle about was like, hey, there's so much sawdust all over our meat. Yeah. It sucks. We <laughs> hate it. We want sawdust as far away from the things we eat as possible. I'm not going to get really excited if I go to the butcher shop and like I see that the butcher's wearing Crocs. Like, hell yeah, you are you, you are non-slip as hell, motherfucker. I'm going to buy all woo. my meat from you. Side note, I recently went to a butcher shop like to buy a like to buy like a roast for christmas and i don't know why i noticed this but like the, my butcher first off he was in an argument with a guy over knife sharpening like a dude nice a dude walked in to the butcher shop while i was there carrying just a tray of knives and my butcher by the way picture a butcher in your head that's my butcher like some nice so, some dudes just look like they were born to be this thing and he's he starts having an argument with the guy who brought in the knives going these better be better than the last time who did you have shopping them the last time what who, who do you got down there that doesn't know what they're doing look look at this and he starts arguing they start arguing back and forth about the quality of the knife and then i noticed that my butcher had a gun <laughs> Like he wasn't planning on uh, out. Like, where was the gun in it, relation to his person? He wasn't waving it around to make emphatic points about the knife sharpening. No, no, the, 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 this dude did not bring n guns to a knife fight. He did not do that. No, but he just he just had one like a just a just a side holster. Yeah. He was open carrying. He, 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 was, he was open carrying. It was in a holster. It wasn't like in the front of it. Like, I guess, like, kept in his apron. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't in his apron. No, he was just on the side. I was just, and I was just kind of wondering why. The cow's already dead, man. In case the meat gets back up. <laughs> <laughs> like, you, maybe he's like, he's working with some real foul meat and he's not 100% positive if it's all the way dead. And to be clear, like, I, this, this butcher shop's in a pretty nice part of town. Like, Crime rate oh, yeah. super low on on this one, so I don't know. I I just I, I got an open carrying butcher butcher. Who, That's fine. Yeah, I, I I guess if if someone's gonna be on the other hand, dude, you have many sharp objects. Like if someone breaks in to steal the this like baloney, you could take if, him out pretty easily. If I was like a cop and I was I'm gonna transport myself to a scene. I'm a cop. I go into a butcher shop and there's been a robbery. And the butcher is telling me, like, yeah, well, I, then I took out my gun and shot him. I would look around at all the various knives and sharp ob objects in there, and i just go, pussy. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, there's no way you don't go, like, like you just look at the giant cleaver and just go, oh, glad you, you had a gun. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> you know, you didn't want to try to history of violence this shit a little bit. I, I also want to be clear here. The the reason why I found the gun a little unsettling is that, like, the butcher... Because it was a gun? The, 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 the main, yes, but also, like, the butcher shop in question is so small that only two customers are allowed in at a time. Like, <laughs> there are roughly, like, 12 square feet of, 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 uh, of distance for anyone to travel. So if he fires that thing, I'm getting hit. Also, if, if that, if, tonight is city. If, 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 like, if that Barney Fife goes off, like... Okay, maybe don't go to that butcher anymore. <laughs> uh, you kind of sold me against it of, like, that might not be a cool butcher. On the other hand, standing rib roast, eleven ninety nine a pound. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Mm. Like, okay, so, so anyway, so Aunt B, yeah. let's go ahead. And she convinces Aunt B to go to Diamond Joe's discount meat market. <laughs> uh, the deal is you can get roast for 10 cents a pound or beef for 10 cents a pound, but you have to like on a one day only sale, but you have to buy an entire side of it. You have to buy 150 pounds of beef, which yeah. I mean, honestly, like those people probably go through cows pretty fast. Like, yeah, probably. I've got a feeling the Andy Griffith show, the, the Taylor household eats a lot of cow. Um, also, this is something I've fantasized about doing a thousand fucking times. Oh, dude, right? Like God, to just have be so sick to just have a freezer full of just multiple cuts of meat, like just whatever just, steak you want for the night. Just just one giant fucking thing of beef, and you go be like, "I'm hungry. I want to make a stew. Carve, carve, carve. Just like throw it in." Yeah, yeah. Or I mean, I think 
if you're lucky, it'll probably cut like become cut into like different sides and different portions and different like things. No, no, I know that's the reasonable way to do it, but I want to just go and be like, I'm hungry, and then just go in and rip off a frozen rib. Wait, I'm sorry, and you... then just throw it into an oven. How do you think this works? Then do you think that they just like give you a hook and you just put half the cow on there yourself? I but, know that's not how it works, but that's how I want and you, it to And work. you just come in with, like, a chainsaw and just, like, slice off what you need? Yes. I, I again, not how it works. How I, I, I it, like, in the six-year-old Dan brain, I just want to go into my freezer in the, like, out back with a meat cleaver and just hack off a piece of steak and then throw it in a frying pan. That's my fantasy. That's the fantasy of a serial killer, dude. <laughs> no! It's cow! Okay, yeah, but yes, that's, that's, how, saying, that's how the... Yes, it doesn't sound great. That, that is how I would show a serial killer practicing in my movie. That's that's that, how multiple it's, movies... It's a to... little Hannibal Lecter now that I'm saying it out loud, Marty. Yes. All right, point made. I understand why the butcher has a gun now. Yes. It's for you. <laughs> because apparently pe- people who are into flanks of meat are deeply or deep down psychopath god damn it i gotta talk to my therapist about this just do like a quick spot check just be like is this anything and then they'll just be like you uh, we'll keep an eye on that one tell me if that tell me if that hunk of meat in your freezer grows a face start calling it mom yeah <laughs> so she buys the meat <laughs> She buys that fucking meat. And here's the thing. At this point, I don't know what the joke is. I don't know if the joke is, haha, why would you buy this meat? Like, why uh, is the joke like, haha, that's too much meat? Because it's not. Like, no. yeah. It, it's like she's getting her, I guess, poetic comeuppance because she bought too much meat and she has a freezer that she got for cheap. So she puts. The meat in the freezer. And this is where and... we learned that, like, first off, and here, here's the real failure. She never plugged the freezer in, so she is... Which is insane. She's putting raw meat in a warm box. Yeah. <laughs> like, we, like fr- freezers need time to freeze. Yes. So she's never plugged the freezer in. She plugs it in, and it starts, like, hopping up and down like a washing machine that's, bro- like, yeah. that's like, overloaded. Like it's a, like me, I expected I'm, I'm gonna... the Muppets to pop out of it. <laughs> like, like it's not it's not like rumbling. It is jumping up and down. Clearly, a bunch of like stagehands were just like like picking it up. <laughs> if you open it up, it's the entrance to Sh- Fraggle Rock. <laughs> <laughs> That's the same joke but, you did, but uh, it's a better spin on it. Uh, you 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 want yes and in yeah. it. Proud of you. Good job. The first time that's ever <laughs> happened on this show. This is a screed against buying in bulk and getting things for cheap, which hinges on the crux of the person being a six-year-old that doesn't plug things in or check the quality of things before using them. So I think, like, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna project a little bit, but I'm gonna say Sean Weed is projecting. It was like you can't buy things in bulk because, like me, you're an idiot <laughs> who doesn't. <laughs> Like, like you, like if you buy a freezer, you'll never try to turn it on because that's what I would do, John Whedon. <laughs> or, or really, it's more like ah, oh, stupid women. Like <laughs> that's what a woman would do. Yeah, no. that's probably more that, what it's that's like. More, it's more what it is. Uh, Aunt B. God, I, how was I in calling John Whedon a fucking six-year-old moron? I was being too you were charitable, being too nice, too nice. Aunt B, like takes out a roast like for for dinner and she says i'm gonna i'm gonna roast this up real nice and i'll have a nice dinner and he comes home he's like wow what are we doing here this is fancy so she like plans a nice dinner to show off like to celebrate this amazing like deal that she got all right whatever i get it i get it and 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 i get like i get like even bargain hunting for sport right some people like to do that this lesson is supposed to be sort of like against doing that to the point where you buy things you don't need like Mm -hmm. a lot of people buy things they don't need because they're cheap my grandmother found a like bargain store where you buy them and then you earn points 
for the stuff you buy and then you can redeem those points for a free thing. And like, I went to visit my grandmother one time and she was like, do you have a, a food processor, a Cousinart? She calls them Cousinarts. It's pretty cute. And I was like, no, I kind of want one. And I assumed that meant that like, she explained this in a very roundabout way. And I was like, okay, so you have one in the garage. Yeah, I'll take a, a Cousinart with me. No, we had to drive to the <laughs> to the to the bargain store. We had to haggle with the bargain store people or uh, harass the poor minimum wage workers that work there. And then and then we had to order the Cousinart and have it shipped to the store. So that meant I had to drive up to Long Island again three weeks later. <laughs> Grandma. <laughs> Uh, Wait, did your grandma actually haggle with somebody? She did haggling occur? Oh, she tries to. She tries. My, oh, it, it wasn't a successful no, it, haggle. No, but my grandmother is a Jewish stereotype when it comes to this stuff. Like she will push for any bargain she can get. So this was well, she like trying to haggle it like a Best Buy. <laughs> Like, she has she, she has to haggle at a Best Buy. That rules. Over, over, I mean, she just no. wants to live in a better world where you can still haggle with no, people. No, it's the shitty kind of haggling where it's just like, this coupon expired six months ago. Can wow. I still use it? Okay. No, it's, it's like haggling still exists. It's just harassment. <laughs> yeah, okay. Knock it off, I Grandma. Want... <laughs> yeah, get out of here, Grandmas, with your coupons that are expired so we all we all know this kind of person and i guess i guess that the episode is trying to say don't be this kind of person but it just comes makes the makes you seem stupid if you do this so andy tastes the meat he goes huh all right and he starts talking to opie and aunt b goes oh you haven't tried the you haven't talked about the meat and andy goes well i wasn't gonna say anything but this roast is a little tough and then Aunt B throws a temper tantrum of epic proportions. She I goes would say into has a nervous melt. She goes into hysterics over this. Yeah, like over Andy saying that the beef is a little tough. Like yeah, and she like throws a fit. She like stomps out of the room. She's like, oh, like her her delicate senses have just been so offended, and it's just this. This is a woman. Uh, I use the word hysterics very deliberately because that's what this is going by. Is like, oh, this woman's so sensitive. She's had her heart broken, and also now she has 150 pounds of this meat that isn't good. Which, by the way, just because one part is a little tough doesn't mean all 150 pounds are are, are tough. Different cuts of meat have different textures. You can cook them different ways. What the fuck? Oh, also make a stew. Yeah, whatever. You like, can just make stew forever. So, and this this made me think about Francis Bavier a lot. So mm -hmm. the the woman who plays Aunt B, his her name is Francis Bavier, and what I've discovered like through some of the discussions uh, that ha take place in the Andy Griffith fandom uh, is that. Famously, Francis Bavier and Andy Griffith did not get along. She was labeled as difficult she was, on the set of the Andy Griffith show. For sure. She was labeled as difficult and they fought a whole bunch and like And it gets more depressing from there. Oh, for sure, right? Well, it, the the thing you sent me opens with her basically saying like I put a lot of work into the role of Aunt B. I brought a lot of like my acting abilities and everybody just liked Aunt B. They didn't like me, which is a huge bummer. And also, but like, yeah, because if you do a really good job playing a care, a beloved character, people aren't like, I love that actor. They're like, Aunt B's my mom. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's yeah. that. It's also like, you know, she had been working in theater and on multiple television shows for like, 40 years by the time the MP yeah. role came. So she was not, she was more experienced than everyone else that was on there. And like, I met, I, I get why you would take that. It's like, oh, this is a good role for an older woman. I'm going to get to be like the, the matriarch of the home. And at the very beginning of the show, like she, it was a good role. And now yeah. she has to do shit like this. She yeah. has to do like, she that woman probably played like Hedda Gabler on Broadway, but the role that everybody remembers her for is just going like, "Who wants chicken?" Yeah. Like not only that, but and, and whenever she does get a chance to do something, it's this bullshit. Imagine getting there and then you got this chinless dipshit, and it's just like, "Oh well, this is the show's going to belong to Don Knotts now. Anything Donnie wants, he gets." Uh, side note: Also, Francis Bavier, super gay. Yeah, super gay. 
plot yeah, twist. Plot twist. Yeah. Like so, she was. It was like an open secret that she uh, she was dating women around that time. So probably something you and me should have found out a while ago. Honest, arguably years ago. No, here I do want to note this is that like the way I found out about this is a friend of mine messaged me and was like, "Did you all mention that Francis Bavier was gay?" And I just never knew about it. And I was like, "No." Everything else in the article I sent you, I already knew because it was discussed heavily in the Andy Griffith fan circles. But not this part. Wonder why. You know who else? Yeah. Gay? George Lindsay. Gomer Pyle. And, and, and really? we'll talk about that in a future episode. He had like a whole like l- like weird love affair or semi love affair with Rock Hudson. We'll talk about that in a, in a different episode. But I, just, I feel so bad for Francis Bavier. Because, like, she's working with a dude that she hates. She's playing the, like, dumb old lady on this show. And everyone's just, like, saying horrible shit about her. Like, she hates men. She doesn't, which is code for, like, she's a lesbian. And she, like, here's this career woman who has mental health issues. And, like, or, I mean, I don't know if she really had mental health issues. The way that she ended her life sounds like it. She she basically turned into a, a hermit outside of Mount Airy, North Carolina. And I don't know. I'm, I, I, this this episode makes me sad. She It makes me sad that Francis Bavier had to put up with this shit. Like, yeah, I mean, they, you, they, the articles are overwhelmingly negative in their portrayal of her. Where it's like, she was difficult on set. And mean to Andy Griffith. And Andy Griffith showed up at her house wanting to hang out. And she was like, no, I don't want to see you. And also, she hated all men. And if you, like, kind of read between the lines, you were just kind of like, everybody treated her like shit because she was an out lesbian in the 60s. They labeled her as a man hater. She probably demanded to be treated with, like, basic respect on set. For sure. She was miserable because she probably hated her fucking character. And she was labeled as America's aunt and, you know, not like a good actor. And so here's uh, here she is throwing a fit about on, on the screen about like just going into full on tears because a man said that the meat was too tough. And then she's just like she's got like the knife at her throat. She's like, just, yeah. just bleed me, Andy. Just cut me and just just leave me for dead. I'm a pointless human being. <laughs> like, and even at, like Andy is just going like, hey, Matt, you didn't fuck up. You didn't cook it wrong. You just bought some shitty meat. Well, just yell at the butcher later. And, and then she's like, well, we have 150 pounds of shitty meat. <laughs> and he's like, yeah. And he's like, oh, OK. This is the point where it becomes very frustrating because also. The freezer is shorting out the power of the house. Right. <laughs> potentially about to cause an electrical fire. And so the freezer is clearly not working. Aunt B tries to hide it from Andy as long as she can in a bit that goes on way too long. Like when he's literally staring at the freezer and she's going, what freezer? What? Yeah. And so like the thing is, the thing is clearly broken and it's a heat wave and they've got a shitload of meat and, 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 and Andy's like, okay, listen, you got to call the, the fridge repairman. You got to call the guy in Mount, in Mount pilot to come over. And he yells, so, call so, the man about call. The man becomes the episodes like catchphrase. So the episode turns into, it starts out and it, it sets up a conflict. And B is always, is always like hunting for a bargain but she goes too far. She's sort of easily tricked by salesmen and trying to spend too little just buying really shitty products that aren't worth as, as much as she's paying. Debatable, stupid problem, a stupid conflict. And rather than resolving that conflict in any way or them sort of having any kind of dialogue about it, it becomes literally call the repairman. You need to call the repairman. Call the repairman, please. You need to call the repairman. And her going, I don't want it, to. It becomes the Sears commercial of another scorcher. Just like yesterday. Yesterday, you said you'd call Sears. I'll call today. You'll call now. It, it's it's that shit. It's, but, it basically turns into, like, an adult trying to feed a baby. And the baby's going, no, I don't she want She doesn't want to call the repairman because she thinks the repairman's going to overcharge. Which, again, like... It's frust- It's deeply, deeply frustrating, but I also get it. It's a generational thing. Again, she lived through the Great Depression. She's 
Like, it's why so many old people are friggin' hoarders. Yeah, it, 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 it's a pathological thing. So she refuses to to pay for this. She's going. She's like trying to figure out any other uh, routine, anybody else she can call. And Andy's screaming, "Pay someone to do this!" Enter Gomer. Mm. Got to remember that Gomer exists. When Gomer's not on screen, all other characters should be asking, "Where's Gomer?" <laughs> Gomer pops in to almost die. Yeah. <laughs> Just real quick, like, hey, I'm Gomer. Do you want to put me in a life-threatening situation? They're like, Gomer, yeah, we do. Come over here and almost electrocute yourself next to a child. Gomer, you you know, you can fix a car, right? And everything is, is very similar. Like, if you can fix a car, you can fix anything, right? Gomer tries to come in and fix the freezer by jabbing a screwdriver into it. And Opie goes, hey, do you want to unplug it first so you don't get electrocuted? And Gomer's like, that's a good idea. And for a brief second, I was like, if Opie hadn't said that, he was about to watch a man fucking die on his, on his back porch. <laughs> like, and, and it would have just hung with him for I'm, the rest of his life of like if i'd only told him to unplug the fridge it, near, it nearly I happens have seen his eyeballs roast in his head it nearly happens anyway because yeah. he cuts the free online yeah it almost <laughs> it almost and, poisons uh, every single yells, one on, on the porch yeah they all like yell it's mustard gas run away <laughs> so fucking dumb like yeah, the the fucking fridge almost shorts out and burns down the house. That Gomer tries to fix it and is like, I don't know how, but sure, I'm an impressionable child who will do whatever I need to for your approval. Do you want to extract free manual labor from me? Gore, sure. <laughs> Aunt B goes and like apologizes to the grocer, uh, and he agrees to like store the meat for her even though he didn't buy she didn't buy it yeah and so like because she flirts with she him. flirts with him she says like if you weren't married like all right can't be i'd fuck your brains Ampy out fucks, like that's our joke yeah, yeah. whatever it's not even, man that joke is less funny now yeah. i'm not I, uh, I, i'm not gonna suggest we retire the joke but like we just don't get that many opportunities to do it any, anymore anyway we'll, we'll we'll let it see see where it goes with it and then she has to she has to load up all of the meat onto Andy's wagon. Or, um, she has to load up all the meat onto Opie's wagon. And so it's just Opie and Opie and Aunt B carting a radio flyer wagon full of steak. <laughs> and, yeah. and by this point, it's kind of starts to sound like a con. Also kind of wondering, how did she get the steak home in the first place? Yeah. Like, yeah. Did, did she also bring it in a in a wagon? The first, what? No. They, oh my god, I didn't even realize how fucking stupid that was. Also, why did she not put it in a car? Why did she put it in a wagon? I mean, I feel the, the Taylor family only has one car, and it's Andy's squad car. So Why did she not just ask someone to drive the meat for her? Yeah, she could have gotten a ride from someone. From Gomer! Why did she... Gomer why did she do, has a million cars. Why did she not do literally any anything else anything other than put a bunch of meat in a wag in a child's wagon because again in this this entire none of this works if aunt b isn't fucking stupid that's the yeah. only way that this episode works there's an okay bit where andy's on the phone and he keeps hearing dogs bark and he's yeah. like what is going on here and he looks out the window and he goes back to the to the phone and he's like oh it's fine it's just opie and aunt b carting a ton of meat by being surrounded by wild dogs wait a minute <laughs> <laughs> a swarm of wild dogs it is actually like a funny visual of just like just an old lady and a young boy in a wagon full of meat getting fucking besieged by stray dogs it would it, it is funny but it would be funnier if like this wasn't like the second or third time when the show was just like we have nothing funny dogs yeah well it does because in the past it's just been like hey you guys want to see of just slightly too many dogs <laughs> in a room you guys want to just see a less than ideal number of dogs and then they finally crack the codes of like what if the dogs attacked an old lady <laughs> would that make it funny and it's like oh yeah actually you did what, it andy griffith what show? if the dogs did what? anything like what if the dogs almost ripped off a young boy's face and it's like you're on to something, bud. Yeah, you know, Good job. You know the, the part when you have friends over, back when you did those things, when you have friends over and you're like, 
All right. Well, I don't. It's too. It's not late enough to ask them to leave. But we've pretty much run out all of the fun cat videos on YouTube on the TV. Like yeah. it's that in television form. I thought you were going to say when you want your friends to leave and you just unleash a swarm <laughs> of wild dogs on you know, them. You, you know how you, you know how you release you the hounds the, on your friends. <laughs> <laughs> you open up the dog room and then they chase your friends out. <laughs> well guys i'm pretty tired so i'm gonna unlock <laughs> unlatch this closet and it's time for you to go no i'm 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 actually montgomery burns yeah <laughs> um <laughs> i'm just very smitten with the concept of a dog sore <laughs> Because one of the dogs is climbing on the meat, which probably means they should throw yeah, it like out. Yeah, that, like, that, hurt, that hurts the resale value. Andy comes in and he's like, no, you fucking don't. You are, I'm, yeah. I'm not going to let you put that poor man out, like, take up his freezer space. You go home, you call the man, keep the meat in the box, don't close, or, I'm sorry, don't open it, just keep it in there, it won't, it won't, like, thaw. And I'm like, yeah, well, dude, it's still a metal box. Yeah. It's a metal box in the, the middle of, in the middle of summer. Like, whatever. I'll tell you one thing. If Andy Griffith didn't hate homeless people so much, I see a very easy solution to this problem. Like, yeah. Go, I'm, I'm sure that there is a food shelter. Or like a, a Call the church. Call anyone. Just, just, just call and be like, yo, I got too much meat. You want meat? I I really can't end up uh, uh, too much meat that I hate I have all this meat that I don't want I do not want to eat it I have no place to put it and it is driving a wedge between me and my family if only there was a solution it's, it's an just an like, easy problem to solve just literally just the church is literally right there give it away <laughs> Like, they're just like, yay, we got the freezer fixed and brought it home and went through all this stuff. We get to have meat that we hate. Right. Congratulations, us. We get to be miserable for like a year. And yeah, to, to be clear, that's how this winds up resolving itself, is that Andy just goes and buys a fucking freezer. He buys it from the repairman and has to haul it off. So now you're still stuck with the shitty meat. Like, yeah. that only solves half of the problem. But then Andy's like, eh, whatever. The the show presents Andy bought a freezer. Like, he thought of something really fucking clever. And he's like, what did you do? Be like, oh, well, I try. I did a little trick. I paid money for an appliance. <laughs> it's a secret. Like he's like like it's like he just fucking pulled off a magic trick. It's like he like he just like did this elaborate like like game of cat and mouse and like switched a bunch of shit around and he just gave a guy like forty bucks. Like it's so fucking stupid. I mean, when everyone around you has the mentality of an eight year old. Yeah. Including the eight year old. Like a man of average intelligence is God. <laughs> I mean, in the in the land of the blind, the man with one eye is yeah. king, and in the land of dipshits, <laughs> the man with three brain cells is a living god. And that's it. That's how they resolve this. The stinger for this episode is everybody just sitting out on the porch, and then OP starts asking what people did before they had freezers, and... Andy goes, oh, we had ice boxes. Boy, you missed out. What well, Ice boxes were great. Like, you had a box with ice in it, and, like, ice trucks would come by, and we would all, when we were boys, we would hop up on there, and we would grab a hunk of ice and just suck on it, and there was sawdust on the ice. This episode's really horny for sawdust. It's uh, love like, sawdust. Old people love sawdust. <laughs> it, boy, it was amazing. Like, nothing like the taste of wet saw. He literally says, nothing <laughs> like the taste of wet sawdust. And I don't understand how Opie's like, what the fuck are you talking about, old man? Because that's what I was doing. Yeah. I, oh, can I? There, There's one scene that we glossed over that we got to okay, talk about. Okay, let's go back. At one point, they're out back and they're just like arguing about the fridge. And Opie walks out not wearing a shirt. And Andy's like, why are you not wearing a Aunt shirt? B. And he's Aunt like, B. 
yeah, I'm sorry. Ampy's like, why are you not wearing a shirt? And he's like, it's hot. And she's like, go put on a shirt. And he's like, okay. And he walks away. It's like, what the fuck was that? There was no joke. There was nothing. It didn't relate to anything. And he wasn't like, wait a minute. Obi not wearing a shirt three scenes ago gives me an idea. It's just a boy walks in, says, I don't have a shirt on. Someone tells him to put it on. He walks away. And there's end of it. It's so weird. Yeah, it's very weird. It's also weird that it's noted in the trivia section of the Ultra Reliable Mayberry Wiki. Here, like In the trivia oh. section, in the episode, we see Opie shirtless. This is one of the only times in the entire series we see a character without a shirt. We actually see one other character shirtless when we see Briscoe Darling sitting in a wash tub taking a bath with no shirt. D- dearly signed, a pervert. <laughs> Someone that was intensely looking. <laughs> you're, you're, you're right, though. Like... It's it's weird that they that they even included that. It's not even a good stalling, you know. It's yeah. it's kind of like it's kind of like watching you know those like Nickelodeon shows that Dan Schneider produced, and you're like, man, there's a lot of like excuses for these teenage girls to be barefoot, huh? Yeah. Yep. 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 <laughs> Wait, who's Dan? Sh- who's Dan Schneider? Dan Schneider. I'm I'm gonna like choose my wording very carefully here. Dan Schneider produced most of the Nickelodeon television shows that you've seen in your life, including like the Amanda Show, and I think he was a Clarissa. No, he he was like some of the later shows. A lot of the like live action Nickelodeon shows from the late '90s and early 2000s were him, and it's never been substantiated. But there's just been like an open secret that Dan Schneider's a fucking creep. And at one point in time, Nickelodeon just kind of slowly and secretly cut ties with him. And I, I like how you're cautious in your language as if we are on anyone's radar enough to get. <laughs> like, <laughs> I say that I'm cautious with my language and then I just call him a fucking creep. Like, <laughs> yeah, just, Dan Schneider was uh, indirectly responsible for nine 11. Like I, <laughs> he did it he was he wasn't on the plane obviously but he knew it was gonna happen and he said nothing bing bang boom speaking of being a fucking creep uh, i want to read this uh this comment while i'm on the ultra reliable mayberry wiki from an anonymous fandom user back in 2015 aunt b seemed to be oblivious to andy's exasperated cries of call the man i guess aunt b like most 1960s nonconformists, didn't want to be beholden to the man and the man is capitalized T and M. Fuck Who would you. Call Aunt B a nonconformist. What, yeah, Aunt what the, the most fuck con- do you think this? I- what do you what do you think is happening? Are you under the impression that that's what a hippie looks like? Aunt B sits at home and cooks all day. Like yeah, like Aunt B's place <laughs> is in the kitchen. I don't. That's the least nonconformity thing I can imagine. <laughs> her def- Finding trait is doing whatever you tell her. Like, like, oh yeah, you know those nonconformists always bringing you things and doing what you tell them and cleaning your home. Ah, oh, I hate them. I hate the way they nonconform and vacuum my living room. Like, how much do you have to hate women if you see fucking Aunt B as a threat, dude? Like, yeah, holy shit. Ah, oh. God. All right, she's. She's like the fucking Terminator of the patriarchy. <laughs> like, she's the, per- it's perfect creation. And you're like, oh, check that one out. That's uppity. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Okay, so, yeah, I want to get back to the to the weird scene on the porch where, like, where Andy is reminiscing about sucking wet sawdust. <laughs> <laughs> and deliver probably the only really funny line in this episode gets delivered when like he's reminiscing about this weird bit of boyhood and he turns to aunt b and he goes you know something's really gone out of life something's really missing from life from those days and aunt b goes yeah typhoid and i was like <laughs> yeah aunt b good job good job yeah. good job like giving a weird middle finger to the entire like premise of this show and also all of its fans but i appreciate that I guess. Yeah. All right, we're, 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 we're going to go to Comics Corner here. Hell, Marty's Comics Corner. And then insert like a, a keytar riff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Sounds good. Catch you guys in the funny pages. <laughs> so from the 1950s to the 1980s, there was a weekly comic strip called Those Were the Days. Hmm. And Those Were the Days was syndicated and it lasted 32 goddamn years. 
And Jesus. every week was basically the same premise. First panel, it used to be. And then a middle panel that says, but now, wow. And then the second panel is, <laughs> now it's. And I posted a bunch of these examples in our uh, Patreon, Discord, and... Join our Patreon. Oh, yeah. Please join our Patreon. Hey, you know what? Actually, quick side note. It's appropriate that we're talking an episode about spending money on stupid things. Because as of right now, The Andy Griffith Show is costing us money. It is, yeah. it is no longer on Netflix or Amazon Prime. Dan and I had to actually give money to watch this episode. Which So th- th- this is our pledge drive. Go to our Patreon, patreon.com slash Breaking Mayberry. Support us with your money dollars. Maybe we'll be like NPR and you'll get a tote bag, you know. But we are doing some neat things. Join our Discord full of, of awesome people and encourage us to stream like old TV episodes on on Twitch is a thing we've done for them. We've, we're putting together at some point a tabletop RPG around the Andy Griffith Show if we get enough patrons. Patreon.com slash Breaking Mayberry. Help us pay for this shit. Okay, back to, back to Comics Corner. Mm-hmm. Comet Marty's Comics Corner. Didn't yeah, so, catch you guys on the funny pages. All right, so we're back. I posted uh, a couple of examples in our Discord, and I posted a few examples as well on the uh, Breaking Mayberry fans Facebook group. But basically, this was written by a man named Art Beeman, and Art Beeman has three different ways of looking at the world. They are, number one, things are different now, and I'm mad about it. Number two, things are different now, and I'm horny about it. And number three, <laughs> things are different now, and I'm mad that I'm horny about it. <laughs> it's it's like, it's a very thinly veiled fetish strip at some point, because it's like he's complaining about how women have agency and do things, and like now women do things that men do, but he's also really clearly turned on by it, because he draws like these sexy women playing baseball, and like... Sexy babes going out and and boxing like well, the very first strip is a is a foxy boxing strip. Uh, one is literally just why do women have jobs? But the other one, the the other thing that I notice about this strip, all of these come from like the 1950s, and it's the same horse shit we see. Wait, are we sure that this is? Those were so I'm looking at one of the ones you posted. Those were the days. Yes. A couple at the beach. Um. And a guy, uh, a guy with his wife, and everybody is dressed in old-fashioned attire. And he's like looking through a spyglass and saying, "23 Skidoo, look at them ankles." But now, wow! And then there's a bunch of hot ladies walking all over the beach, and he says, "I come to the beach for a rest. Let me get sleep." Yeah, he's like, he's bored of all these hot ladies. There's another one I'm looking at right now that's like in panel one. Those were the days, and it's like a, an old school marm who's teaching children, and it says, once all a teacher had to know was about reading, writing, and arithmetic. And the school mom's like, turn to page four in McGuffey's Reader. But now, wow, she has to know law, too. And it's all these kids being brats, and one kid's like, I refuse to answer, teacher, on grounds that my testimony might incriminate me. One girl's like, teacher, slap my hands. I'll sue her for assault. And one kid's like, I'm not dumb. I'm just emotionally maladjusted. It's literally just like, Today's kids are too spoiled. We should beat them more. We should beat them in schools. But this was in 1951. There's another one that's literally, it's literally seduction of the innocent. It's like, kids used to be have very delicate feelings. Oh, how ghastly. Hansel and Gretel pushed the old witch into the oven. Oh, the wolf has killed and eaten Red Riding Hood's grandmother and they're crying. And then, but now, wow. And it's kids reading comic books going, boy, old One-Eye the pirate's gonna slit the throats of his victims. Yeah, well, my guy horribly punishes, poisons his enemies. Like, I mean, this is a very beautiful genre of uh, comic strip in that it is just the writer airing personal grievances. <laughs> Some of which don't even make sense. What if when, yeah. What is just him being mad that planes are faster than boats? <laughs> You know, back in the old days, neighbors that used to know their place. Now, my neighbor Todd is yelling at me about building a fence on the property line. Shut up, Todd. <laughs> There's one where he's mad about about the disappearance of swimming holes. But now, wow, kids have to go to the pool where there's plenty of rules and regulations. It's not like in my day where you could go down to the swimming hole. And I want to point out, this is from 1951. Fucking 16 years before the Andy Griffith, at least 10 years before the Andy Griffith show. And even at that point, the, the fishing hole was like, the swimming hole was like a, a point of innocence. Guess what, guys? 
swimming holes have never disappeared. Like there are, yeah, I can go to a swimming. I've been to a swimming hole this year. There are always outdoor places of bodies of water, like probably natural, that are used as unauthorized swimming pools. Like you, you, there are always places where teens can go to swim and do drugs and fuck and probably drown. Those still exist. But my point, my I point mean, is. None of wait, wait, before you make your point. Before you make your point, can I just point out about the uh, the swimming hole comic? Those were the days. Swimming hole, bunch of nude boys, bunch of naked kids, uh, nude naked boys. Yeah, yeah. And, but now, wow! Oh, these kids are wearing clothes at the swimming pool. I are beaming and so <laughs> mad about it. Livid. I also have to point out, like one of the things he says that sucks about swimming pools is how there's signs and rules and regulations that say no running and you can't do this. And, and honestly, like the thing that saves it is I really like this art style. But in the first panel with the swimming hole, there's a sign that says no fishing. So he already put an arbitrary rule and regulation in his fucking like fantasy world. Oh my god, you're so bad at your one job. All right, this is. Great. This is a this is an absolute gold mine that you've discovered. Anyway, anyway, my point is that John Whedon, like Art Beeman, is nostalgic in a very weird way that people are still nostalgic for, and he's still promoting a world that did that never existed. He's nostalgic for a world that never existed. His nostalgia carries over into the Andy fucking Griffith show nostalgia. 10 years later is still nostalgic for the same things, the weird. And then some of it is exactly identical to complaints. I've heard all my life that like people don't work, work, look hard enough to get a job anymore. And kids are too spoiled these days. And, but now, wow, women are taking over places where they shouldn't be. None of this ever went away. And even in 1951, they were complaining about, how things had changed and we can't get wet sawdust anymore. Shut up, John Whedon, you weirdo. I mean, a, a, a great thing about these, about these comic strips. And I think it extends to all of this, this sort of nostalgia is like in the, in the old, like the back in the days things, everybody, it looks so fucking miserable. Everybody is mad and like grumpy and yelling and looks really uncomfortable and unhappy in their lives. And everybody in the, but now just looks are like having a good time. It's so great of like, I want to, I want to go back to those good old days when I was miserable. My wife was miserable. Everyone around me was miserable and we wore uncomfortable clothes. I want to go back to that. People are too goddamn happy. And this days. is why I really can't hate this comic strip is because I don't believe that Art Beeman actually believes his own bullshit. Like just the the way that he draws the like modern panels looks so much more fun. And I think I think yeah. I think that he knows that he's full of shit, but that actually kind of makes it worse. Anyway, this ran for thirty two years. It's incredible. How much could you milk this? So if you want to see some examples, of- but but the thing is, but all right. Okay, so here's... All right, all right. Hold up, hold up, hold up. So it ran for 32 yeah. years. And the whole thing is about the good yes. old days. Do you think the good old days moved <laughs> along with the decades? Or was was he always just saying, I wish it was 19, 1941 <laughs> still? Or or is he... Did it, like, did the good old days move to, like... Like, like, oh man, you know what fucking ruled? The 60s. I wish it was still I the 60s. I don't know. I, I can't wait to like, like, uh, I'm kind of going through these archives and they're kind of like being posted by collectors that I know. So I have not seen the 80s ones. For all, for all it, I know, they may have just re-ran it. Like. Because if he, if it's the first option and he stuck to the same time period, it must have gotten to the 80s and they're like, what the <laughs> fuck are you talking about, old man? Which is how I feel about, like. Opie asking Andy what they did before freezers. And and, and yeah. Andy says they had ice boxes and he laments, you know, having polio and sucking on ice cubes. And then a- o- a- Opie says, okay, well, what did they do before then? He's like, well, they had coolers. They had cellars that kept everything cool. And don't ask me about then because then we had the ice age. Whatever. Meh, 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 meh. Wait, so are we leaving Marty's Comics Corner? Yeah, I think we're going to slide out of Marty's Comics Corner. If you, if you... Marty's Comics Corner! What's the, what's the outro line? We opened with See You in the Funny Pages, which should have been the outro. Right. Marty's Comics Corner! 
and then you skateboard away. If you want to see these comics, by the way, I posted some on the Breaking Mayberry fans Facebook page, Facebook group. So you can go join that group or you can get bonus access to a lot of them with commentary by me in our discord, which you can access by being on our Patreon. OK, last plug. Got Not it. plugging anymore. And that's that's kind of it. They just kind of sit there reminiscing and then the freezer starts to cause an electrical surge again. And yeah. and then and, and Andy does close this on a but now. Wow. Because he's like, well, we used we live in an age of miracles. We sure have come a long way. But now. Wow. We're cursing at the fridge. Oh, it was like we used to curse at the weather. Now we're cursing at the fridge. <laughs> Shut up, John Whedon. John Whedon is John Whedon is such a shitty writer. The, he sets up like the dullest possible conflict and then just like gets bored and wanders away into a shopping mall. Like he just leaves. It, it, it like, really reads like a script written by a man, like in the early stages of early onset dementia. Like, like yeah. Like, you, can you imagine what the writer's room had to edit out of his original pitch? Like, like they must have the, 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 deli- the, the shredded pages of this script must just be absolutely deranged. Like, there must just be an entire page that's just like, and another thing, why are strawberries so goddamn expensive now? This episode sucks. This episode this sucks, episode sucks for a number of reasons. Primarily because it starts off being something that I understand, recognize, and can relate to, and then slides into assholeville, like, immediately. Like, I mean, yeah, once you're... Wow. Welcome to the joy of adulthood where you're constantly trying to decide on whether or not you should spend more or less on something relative to uh, the potential quality. So much comedy. And you constantly so have- much comedy can be yeah. brought from that. It's it, it's a universal premise. Yeah, but it's not exactly a fun one. It's not something I like just think there's some aspects of life where you could just do that comedy thing of like. You ever think about this? And then you're like, ha ha, yeah, one of the wheels on the shopping cart is always fucked up. <laughs> it's not exactly a thing that you can just be like, you know how you're constantly tr- uh, stressed out about how to spend your money? Ha ha ha, thanks, John Whedon. Love it. Fucking ass. We done? I think we're done. We done? Whedon? <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> God, would someone please cancel us? <laughs> please dig up some fucked up shit we said so that we can stop doing this. Uh, all right, ratings for this episode. I mean, the episode sucks. Andy Meter. I'm gonna give it a three. Just really, just I'm, for that typhoid joke. I you, I'm gonna put it at a four because of the image of a dog humping a pile of meat in a wagon. <laughs> <laughs> and that image earns all the points for me. That typhoid joke, type nah, that typhoid joke did not do shit for me. It's all just a dog climbing on a pile of meat. Yeah, of course that would be the one that gets point from you, you weird meat pervert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, I just like to see my meat defiled. I don't understand what's so weird about that. God, Barney meter. Hmm, Barney meter is tough um, on this one. Okay, so in the grand scheme of things, again, uh, previous episode this season convinced the world, America that being homeless is right. a choice. Still fucked up. It's not a zero. It's not a zero because it has some weird shit about how you shouldn't try to save money. So a uh, two. Yeah, I, 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 I feel two. like that's that's appropriate. I mean, like I, I have yeah. I have my own issues with like how Aunt B was portrayed in this and like how it treats people in general. Yeah, you yeah, actually, yeah, it was sexist, sexist, sexist. I mean, uh, sexist, I mean but, but but again, and we don't really understand. We don't even understand our own scale. I'm not giving it points just for being sexist on its own. Like, I, I I don't think this sexism was, like, any more permanently no, 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 no. damaging than, than every other type of sexism. But what if this helped originate the concept of women be shopping, Marty? Four, five, what if this contributed five, it's, to that? it's a four, whatever. Uh, let's say a four, just to be safe. Just to be safe, we're going to say a four, because, you know, old sexism. You never know how that snowball picked up momentum as it rolled down the mountain. That's fair, that's fair. Uh, we, we yeah, safe yeah. So we got to put it at a four. So there we go. Also Vietnam. Right, Vietnam. Vietnam. So there's that episode of television. That's the Andy Griffith show. God damn it. Yeah. Uh, uh, so you got something else? 
No, no, go ahead, go ahead. I'll save until after. As always, on the internet, you can get at us. Facebook.com, we are under the fan page, Breaking Mayberry Fans. Come and join our, our, our group. Twitter.com slash Break Mayberry. Instagram, Breaking Mayberry. Maybe I'll put a couple of these on Instagram. I don't know. I already told you I wouldn't plug the Patreon anymore. So, also on the internet, I am at Schneid Remarks. That's S-C-H-N-E-I-D Remarks. Come watch me and my fiance Sarah build Lego sets. Twitch.tv slash BrickSmarties. I should really get on Twitch and do some Twitch it's stuff. It's fun. I should, it's fun. Yeah, Come I should get on Come hang with that. us, and we're, we're just, we'll be adorable and build, not you and I will be adorable. I mean, you and I are adorable together, but I... Yeah, yeah, we're but, delightful. But, but I meant myself and Sarah. Come watch us be cute and build Lego kits together. Other than that, I think that's uh, that's it for us. Thanks for listening. We will see you all down at the fishing hole. Oh,